very pleased to introduce Dr. Carolyn Denton, professor in the Children's Learning Institute, which is part of the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Houston. Uh, Carolyn received her PhD from Texas a and University, and so you all have hope <laughs> in 2000, and her research focuses on the identification prevention and remediation of reading difficulties and disabilities, text processing in adolescence, and the role of the reading coach. Her current research project examine interventions for children who have both ADHD and reading difficulties, early reading intervention that addresses both word reading and comprehension development, and text processing and reading comprehension in adolescence. She is the author or co-author of numerous articles and book chapters and four books on these and related topics and has consulted, provided <coughs> professional development and presented her research across the US and in Europe and Asia. Dr. Denton was a co-recipient of the 2006 Albert J. Harris Award from the International Reading Association, awarded annually for a journal article that makes a significant contribution to the understanding of reading difficulties or disabilities. The title of our presentation is Effective Early Reading Interventions, What Are the Essential Ingredients? So please help me welcome Dr. Charlene Dyson. PhD is in EdSci, and I did that uh, in special education, and that was with Jan Hasbrook when she was here, and Richard Parker, many of you know him. He was uh, on my committee and very instrumental in working with me. So, uh, very, very pleased to be back, and I appreciate the, uh, the invitation. So, I'm today... and we know a lot about what works as far as teaching word reading in particular. 
Um, we know that children with reading difficulties and disabilities benefit from explicit instruction that's direct, that uh, is thoughtfully uh, planned, and uh, that basically teaches them what they need to know. That has been shown through numerous studies. But there are still some areas of disagreement in the field. One of those, and this gets kind of down to the finer points, I guess. Whether, how much time should be devoted to phonics instruction. For example, if I, one of the things that I do is that I uh, develop reading interventions. So if I'm developing a first grade intervention, should I, uh, and I only have 30 minutes, for some reason teachers think that's the magic number. We tried to do a 40 minute one at one point and got shot down by the teachers, no, 30 minutes. <laughs> Um, how much of that time should I spend, have the children spend, in phonics instruction in isolation, direct instruction and practice? Should, does it matter if the phonics instruction is integrated with other instruction that children receive in the classroom? In other words, Back in the bad old days, we had something called the Reading Wars, where we had a group who didn't recognize the need for teaching phonics at all, basically, except in context when, when the opportunity arose as children were reading. And we had this other group who thought it was a really good idea to have a systematic approach to phonics instruction. Then people decided we needed this balanced reading approach. And so within that balance, sometimes children get, uh, say, a guided reading approach within the regular classroom, and then um, a phonics program, sometimes taught at a different time of the day. And teachers say, well, they're getting both. The question is, does it matter if those are integrated, if they really work together? Does that really make a difference? How much time should students be spending out of that 30 minutes that I, I have reading connected text versus practicing phonics, reading words and giving letter sounds in isolation, not in, within the text? Um, should these programs be scripted? So there's a lot of controversy about that. Some people say yes, that's the way to have good fidelity. Uh, to the program. Some people say no, that negates the teacher's role. Uh, so, again, questions. What kind of text should they read? Some people say they should read the level books that are used in guided reading, uh, like the level by uh, Fountas and Pinnell. Some people say, oh no, they should read decodable text. And decodable text, uh, if you don't know, means that children have been pre-taught all of the letter sounds and the sight words they would need to read that text. So they can sound out every word or recognize it because they've been taught those irregular words. Um, what word reading strategy should children be taught? In one approach, children are taught to look at a picture in kindergarten or and in first grade to look at a picture to help them figure out what words are. Others say that's not such a good idea and they should be taught just to send out words. And how intensive should tier two and tier three intervention be? By tier two and tier three, I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact that I have undergraduates, graduate students, and faculty, so I may be explaining too much, but um, by Tier 2 and Tier 3, we mean supplemental layers of increasingly intensive intervention for children who don't respond well to just good quality classroom instruction, bringing in extra intervention, and if they don't respond well to that, increasing the intensity. But there are a lot of questions about how intensive that intervention should be. All right, so the research I'm going to describe took place actually from 2000 through 2013. 
the first study, um, which was in 2000 to 2002, really sort of laid the foundation for the work that I've done afterwards, and it's published in Mathis et al. 2005. By the way, at the end, I'm going to give you a web address where you can find the uh, slides for the presentation. In that study, there were six schools, and we provided intervention for 40 minutes a day. We got 40 minutes, five days a week, and pretty much all school year. Um, intervention was delivered by certified teachers who we, the research team, selected. We paid them, we trained them, we coached them. So we had very high fidelity of implementation. And it was provided in addition to the children's regular classroom reading instruction. We tested two interventions and compared them to what we call typical practice in the schools. So in many of our studies, probably in all of them but one that I've done, that's an intervention study, we do make a comparison, all two, I just remembered another one, a comparison to typical practice. And that means children get whatever the school would have given them had we not walked in the door. So that's a comparison group that we often use. So one of the two research interventions was called the proactive intervention. And that is a fully scripted program, direct instruction, uh, very explicit instruction in phonemic awareness and phonics, synthetic phonics, which means blending sounds to sound out words, um, very carefully constructed scope and sequence, uh, scripted, a lot of practice of skills in isolation where the teacher holds up a page of letters and the children, you know, the teacher points and the children give the sounds and they do some drill that way to try to bring that knowledge to <coughs> authenticity. Um, fully decodable text, so everything that the children were asked to read, they could sound out or recognize words as sight that they had been taught. The other intervention was called responsive intervention. And it was the same in some ways, but very different in others. It came from sort of the guided reading approach, but with some differences. It included integrated instruction in phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, and comprehension. Um, very explicit systematic phonics instruction and practice 10 minutes a day. So out of that 40 minute period, 10 minutes or a fourth of the time was devoted to phonics instruction and practice out of context, out, not during reading or writing of text. Um, we used a lot of hands-on manipulatives, like having children write on whiteboards, using magnetic letters that they manipulated, that sort of thing in this approach, and that wasn't prominent in the other approach. Um, most of the lesson was spent actually reading and writing connected text. We had a 10 minute writing segment in this one. Very frequent assessment of different kind, uh, targeted instruction based on the assessment, and this one was not scripted, but what we had was what we called a menu of activities. So it was a list of different instructional activities and there were directions about how to implement each of those activities, but the teacher selected from that menu what was needed to address the needs of the students in that small group. All right, so it, was a, it wasn't sort of a free for all, do whatever you want, because the activities were described and we trained the teachers in how to do them but the teacher sort of picked from that menu and built the lesson for the child. We used level text, uh, like the text used in guided reading. It was not decodable text. We, rather than teaching children to use pictures to try to figure out what words are to rec uh, as a way of word identification, we taught them one three-step strategy, and that is that we taught, this was in first grade, we taught the children when you get to a hard part, 
This is in first grade language. This is what we want you to do. First, look for parts you know. So that gets them looking for a TH cluster instead of just the T and the H separate. As they learn more, it gets them looking for uh, familiar chunks of words, not just isolated letters. Then sound it out, including putting those chunks together, and then check it with the context by putting it back in the sentence and rereading. So guided reading teaches many strategies. The Fountains of Pinal, the reading recovery uh, approach teaches a lot of different strategies. We, uh, and I found, I was a teacher before I came back and did my PhD work, uh, and I taught those kids. And I really felt strongly that the most at-risk kids had a lot of trouble finding the right strategy and choosing a strategy out of a whole list that we tried to teach them. Um, that takes a lot of what we call executive control, being able to plan and select the right strategy for the right situation, and at-risk readers typically are a little low in that department. Um, so we decided to simplify it. Every time they got to a hard word, look for parts you know, sound it out, check it. Multi-syllable <coughs> words, same thing. Those, they would figure out each syllable, blend them together, make sure it makes sense. Okay, so in this study, we went in at the end of kindergarten and then for new children new to the school at the beginning of first grade, and we screened them um, using pretty stringent criteria to find those who were really at risk for reading problems. We randomly assigned within each school. So we didn't have one school do one thing and another school do another. Within each school, just randomly by chance, children might be in quality. All of them got regular classroom instruction from their teacher, plus that proactive in, uh, intervention. That's the scripted one. Or they might get that responsive intervention or they might just get whatever the school would typically do with them. Now this was back in 2000 and 2001, and at that time there wasn't a whole lot of additional supplemental intervention being provided by the school. So out of the six we worked with, only two were providing any supplemental intervention for at-risk kids. That has improved a bit. So we also tested a group of normally, develop, uh, normally developing students to sort of give us a normative reference or control that we could compare the progress of the at-risk students to. So the results. The results were unexpected to some of the people I was working with at that time. And that is students in both intervention groups when we compared them to typical practice, so looking at that comparison, proactive versus typical practice, responsive versus typical practice, both groups performed significantly, significantly better than comparison kids in phonological awareness, word reading, both timed and untimed, spelling, and one, we had two cohorts of students, and in one cohort, oral reading fluency was statistically significant, and the other it was not. The only difference between the two groups that was significant was that that scripted intervention did result in significantly better outcomes in phonological decoding. That's the Woodcock-Johnson word attack test, and that is a test of nonsense word reading. Now, nonsense word reading does matter because if you think about a syllable, most syllables are little nonsense words, right? And if kids can't figure out using phonics how to read each syllable, once they get into about fourth grade, their word reading starts to kind of implode on them. And they do a whole lot of guessing. They look at the beginning of the word and they guess the rest. So it does matter. The proactive intervention did better. The responsive intervention did better than the comparison students in comprehension, but I just hate it when this happened. The 
he valued was 0.06. So <laughs> we can't really take credit for it. You know, it's one of those. Um, this shows growth in word reading. And I think it's, we, we tested four times over the school year. Um, and what you're seeing is that the bottom line is the typical practice controls. I'm sorry, I'm going to be a little less formal, but I'm hot. <laughs> um, the proactive and responsive interventions are very, very close to each other, no difference. And there are the normally developing kids. So you see the at-risk kids started out quite a lot lower. These are Z scores, so the average is the line mark zero. Okay? Um, and so the at risk kids started out way below average. All three groups, from the first test in October to the second one in December, were about the same. But at that point, they really started to diverge. And I think I see this when. They, the at-risk kids start to accumulate enough knowledge of phonics and of uh, word parts that they can recognize that they begin to go from lower level skills to higher level skills and get better at those. So we definitely saw that. And we didn't quite close the gap with the normal, normally developing children, but we did pretty darn well. This is the same thing but with oral reading fluency. Fluency is harder to impact through interventions, uh, typically, at least for very low word readers. Now, if fluency is the only problem, that's another issue. But for very low ability readers who have trouble with words, actually reading words, fluency takes longer to impact. And we often find in our intervention studies that we uh, really get them back to average in their word reading, but that fluency lags. You can see, I think this, we actually sampled every three weeks in this study, uh, oral reading fluency, and you can see at about 0.7, again, the uh, different groups begin to diverge. And there's really a curvilinear growth pattern at that point. So, what about response to intervention? Well, response to intervention depends on how you measure it. In this study, we looked at the Woodcock-Johnson basic reading cluster, and we sort of did a dividing line at the uh, 30th percentile, and looked at whether they ended up above that, at or above that, or below it. And so, just with quality classroom instruction, this is those at-risk kids 84% met that benchmark, and that surprised us. But with uh, intervention, 99% and 93% of the children met that benchmark. So it was a pretty powerful intervention. So what are the implications of that? Well, it was, this is actually the one that won the award from the International Reading Association. It was published in Reading Research Quarterly. And I think the reason is that we had two approaches that came from sort of different theoretical orientations. So one, the proactive, very behavioral, you know, teach and practice, teach and practice. The other, having some behavioral aspect, but also a lot of the cognitive uh, theory behind it because as children read they were coached in how to uh, better apply the strategies they had learned and the skills they had learned. But both of these sh were proven to be very effective uh, based on this study. And uh, so we looked at what did they have in common. Well they both had explicit carefully sequenced instruction in phonetic awareness and phonics. So we proved, we sort of showed again what the research had a tendency to show before then, and that is that these at-risk kids benefit from explicit <laughs> instruction that's carefully sequenced or systematic. Both provided intervention of high intensity, five days a week, 
40 minutes every day. It was a pullout. We took them out of their classroom, focused their attention on the teacher, high intensity. Um, and it was provided, both had very well trained teachers <coughs> provided in addition to quality classroom instruction. So that was in common. But the difference is that related to whether the program was scripted, whether they used decodable text, how much time they devoted to reading and writing versus decontextualized practice, that didn't result in a big difference. The only difference was in that one measure of nonsense word reading. So this, to me, was very important because if you're going to scale up interventions and put them in many different settings, you're going to have some teachers, some principals, some schools who want a scripted program. You're going to have some who will not work with you if you have a scripted program. I've been there. I know what I'm talking about, okay? And I think if there's more than one way to get to something and they're both effective, then that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Maybe we don't have to be quite as rigid in what we say has to be there. So the next study sort of, this is where it came from. That's fine when the intervention is delivered by a specially chosen, highly trained teacher, and the researchers are right on top of them all the time. But what happens out in the real world? So uh, Patricia Mathis and I got a grant to uh, do a scale-up study, a scaling-up study of the same two interventions, responsive and proactive. Um, that study took place in many school districts. This was just from one year, and this was a four-year study where we replicated it every year. Um, many school districts, all in Texas, but you know, a very wide geographical area. If this were the Northeast, that'd be in what five states, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's just Texas is big. So I'm just what we did in that study. First of all, is that we gave schools a choice. We said, if you want to participate, you can either do the proactive intervention or the responsive intervention. So the two were not compared to each other. They were both compared to typical practice in the schools. All right, so that was the design. I'm just going to talk about the responsive intervention portion because I developed the responsive intervention and that's sort of the line of research that I continue. Patricia Mathis uh, would have some evidence about the proactive intervention. In this scale up, in the responsive part, we were in 31 schools with 40 different teachers. They were regular school district employees. We had some uh, reading specialists. We had some classroom teachers. We had uh, a couple of librarians who were actually certified teachers. We had a couple of paraprofessionals that were certified but weren't actually teaching. And we had one PE coach who was coaching at the middle school, had never taught reading in her life, and she actually did a really good job because she was a very visual learner and we had videotapes of the intervention and she watched those and got it and really did, had better fidelity than some of the other teachers, for sure. Because she didn't have come in with preconceived ideas about how it should be done. We randomly assigned within those schools to responsive or typical school practice. And you can see as time goes on, more of the typical practice included alternative interventions. So, the school could provide an intervention if they wanted to. We didn't, and it would be unethical for us to interfere with anything the school was going to do. And as a matter of fact, we helped the school out because we took half of their kids off their hands, basically, and took care of what was going on with them. And so the school was more free uh, as far as resources to provide intervention to the rest of the kids. Um, we provided them with the materials for the intervention and with some professional development. But that's it. Then we just monitored what was going on. 
fidelity and intensity of implementation was controlled by the schools. So by intensity, I mean some schools, they provided it five days a week, the way it was supposed to be. Some didn't do it for two weeks at a time. Some did it now and again. One uh, group I remember in a small town was supposed to be taught by a special ed teacher and every time she turned around, she had an art meeting and canceled the group for everything. You know, that was the easiest thing to cancel. So we had very wide implementation. We did observe fidelity. We had fabulous teachers and we had some that were not. <laughs> And yet, and so I'll tell you, during this study, I really thought, we're not going to get anything here. But we had significant differences favoring that responsive intervention approach in all of those areas, including comprehension this time. And the thing that floored me is for the Woodcock-Johnson measures, of which we gave four, uh, letter word identification, word attack, spelling, and passage comprehension, on those, the effect <coughs> were larger in this study than they had been in the control study. And that brought up something I don't have time to talk about today, but thinking about the balance between fidelity and flexibility. Because we want fidelity to our implement, uh, of implementation. That means the teacher does it the way it's designed, because that's how it was done in research. So we know that way works, right? Or flexibility, meaning teachers need to be able to adapt it to their own situations. So there's, I think, always sort of a push and pull between those two in interventional research. And this kind of really brought that uh, front and center for me. So at that point, we decided, well, I wonder what would happen if we used responsive reading for a tier three intervention. Now, tier three students are students that would typically, in some models, uh, qual be qualified for special ed. They would definitely be evaluated for having a reading disability. So these are students who are more impaired. Um, a lot of people seem to think a scripted program is probably the only way to go with these students. So I was interested in finding out what would happen here. Uh, this paper was published in 2013 in uh, uh, Journal of Insight. So this was a second grade study because these kids had all had intervention that we provided in a different study that I didn't tell you about. Uh, in first grade, and they had not met um, either word reading and or fluency benchmarks. So we looked at two kinds of benchmarks to qualify them, and they had to qualify on one or the other, basically, to be in this tier three study. Um, they were randomized to the experimental tier three intervention versus typical practice again, and in tier three, we used an adapt uh, adaptation of responsive reading. And the reason it was adapted is that I wrote higher level activities uh, because it was in the second grade, more emphasis on syllable types and syllable word reading. Um, and we added text at higher levels, of course. And we used, uh, we adapted the Read Naturally Fluency Program. So this was done 45 minutes a day because it was tier three. Now at tier three, you can get away with longer interventions because tier three is supposed to be more intense than tier two interventions. Uh, we did this for about 25 weeks. We did it in groups of two to three students. So very small groups also, high intensity. And again, we did get several uh, uh, we did get significant differences on several of our variables. We did have a large percentage meet benchmarks for word level uh, response to intervention, but a lot, even on average, the students really remained impaired in fluency and comprehension. And so this is sort of the beginning of a trend we see throughout the school age or the school years and that is 
intervene early. Do it in kindergarten and first grade. If you wait till even second grade, it gets a little harder. If you wait until middle school, it gets a lot harder. And I just finished an intervention study with ninth and tenth graders who were very poor readers. And I'll tell you that you better have them for two or three years if you're really going to make an impact. Because there are a lot of layers of behaviors and defenses and bad habits to peel back before you even get to where you can really teach. Now, I did want to add this. I'm talking about an unscripted intervention using non-decodable text, but I don't want you to get the wrong idea. Scripted interventions are also very, uh, uh, work very well in many studies. We have a lot of studies, especially for kids with reading difficulties and reading disabilities. So don't think one way is the only way. My whole point today is there's more than one way. Um, and I think that, well, first of all, programs don't teach kids, teachers do. And so what you do with the program matters. I've seen people think scripted programs will always result in very high fidelity of implementation. And I have seen the worst teaching probably, well, not the worst I've ever seen, but some of the worst, with a woman who used a scripted program and delivered it mechanically and paid no attention to whether the students were actually mastering anything as they went along. So the kids just got more and more confused and more and more behind because she just kept churning out that program. She'd turn the page and they'd do the next script. Turn the page, do the next script. That is a huge pitfall with the scripted program. You've got to watch out for that. If you use that kind of program, if you work with teachers who use that kind. I think, again, providing choices might be the best thing to do. So then I got to thinking, well, what does it matter? And is it indeed that explicit and systematic phonics instruction? I was also very interested in looking at an evaluation of guided reading. And so the last study I'm going to share with you today was one that was just published 2014, hot off the presses. Um, and this was um, an evaluation of guided reading as compared to a more explicit approach. If um, I actually have that. Guided reading is a very popular approach to reading instruction, and I'm not here to say there is anything wrong with it. What we wanted to know is what are the effects on the most at risk kids. Um, the thing that makes it very hard to study is it's implemented very differently in different classrooms. All across the country, there's actually an article that uh, documents this very different levels and types of implementation. Uh, so that's not, they call it guided reading, but if you're reading a study and they don't really describe the intervention very well, you really don't know what that condition was like. There's actually very little experimental research of guided reading. There's a lot of qualitative research. There is descriptive, there are descriptive papers. There are some quasi-experimental, but very, very little experimental research. And we reviewed all of those studies uh, in our paper. Um, we decided, because this intervention varies so much in different implementations, and because we wanted to control how it was implemented, we decided to do it within an intervention. So we did it as a pullout. It was not done as classroom reading instruction. We pulled kids out of their classrooms and provided this instruction in small groups because then we would have control over it and we could document what was really happening. Um, we used the guided reading book, kind of the Bible of guided reading by Fountas and Pinnell, which was published back in 96 and a series of videotapes that Fountas and Pinnell made to train teachers to implement guided reading. 
and we went through those. I watched those tapes many, many times over. We listed every activity and approach that they recommended or mentioned at all. And all of those were fair game for inclusion in that guided reading intervention. Um, and we looked at effects for second grade children with reading difficulties. This was done in 11 schools in two locations. Um, we screened kids at the end of first grade. They qualified uh, if they had standard scores below 93 um, on either Woodcock Johnson letter word identification or tower sight word reading efficiency. That means timed word reading or untimed word reading. We looked at those two and they could qualify on each one, which really mimics what we did in that tier three intervention that I just described. So all of the qualifying students who were there the following fall were randomly assigned within each school to get the guided reading intervention and explicit instruction intervention or typical practice. So we did have that comparison group. Most of these kids were in second grade, but we did have a few who were in first grade because they were repeating first grade. They had done first grade one time, they had had tier one and tier two intervention, had not responded well, and they were actually repeating first grade, and we did tier three with them. So, essential characteristics of guided reading. Small groups, homogeneous, meaning kids with about the same reading level, and needs. Um, reading for meaning is quite primary in a guided reading approach and word level instruction is secondary to that. The primary role of the teacher is to support students during reading to promote the use of multiple reading strategies. Students are taught to use pictures and context as well as letter sound correspondence to identify unknown words. It does not include as described by Fountas and Pinnell, systematic phonics instruction. It uses level text and word identification is taught by in that synthetic phonics, which is blending sounds, but also analogy phonics, which means think about a word you know to help you read a word you don't know. In other words, if a child is reading along and comes to the word plow and stops, the teacher might say, do you know another word like that? And if they don't, the teacher might say or write on a whiteboard, cow, and say, you know that word. If you can read cow, you can read plow. So see, that's an analogy approach to phonics. So guided reading really uses both. The guided reading condition in our study, we followed the videotapes uh, made by Fountas and Pinnell. Uh, for the parts of the lesson. The teacher introduces the text. Kids read a new book each day. They're the little leveled books. Uh, there's a part called Supporting Effective Reading when students read aloud. Um, the teacher prompts them and supports them and provides scaffolding as they read. There's very brief letter and word instruction, always in the context of word reading or in the context of reading. So if a child gets to a difficult word, the teacher might pull it out, write it on a whiteboard, and go through some instruction to teach them how to read it, put it back in, and the kid reads. All right, so it's in context. Um, there's a, the next part is called teaching processing strategies after reading, where they return to the text after the uh, reading is done and the teacher reinforces one or two uh, places in the text where the child used effective strategies and praises them and said, oh, you did a really good job here. You made a mistake and you corrected it all by yourself. That is what good readers do and I really like to see that, you know, that sort of thing. And one or two teaching points. So back on this page, little child, you missed this word, and let's take a look at it and see how you could have used your strategies to figure it out, for example. The next part is called discussing and revisiting the test text, which is a discussion of the meaning of the text. Then they do have assessment, 
which usually consists of a running record of text reading, the MARI Play Observation Survey, or the DRA, Developmental Reading Assessment, which gives you levels of books. There were also optional components that were listed on the video, and we included those. Um, extending the meaning, which is an extended comprehension uh, instruction. Working with words, and this was taken right from the Fountas and Pinnell book. So in the book it says, up to five minutes of brief activities where the child uh, can learn how words work. So, five minutes. And in the book, Fountas and Pinnell list word reading activities, these different things like word sorts or uh, different activities that could be used. And those were all taught to our teachers who implemented this in the research, and they could choose any of those. We also said they could take some time for focus to work with one student in the small group while the others read familiar text for practice, for fluency practice, or they could reread text for fluency practice with the whole group for up to 20 minutes. So this was the part that was optional, and teachers could control what they wanted to do. All right, so that was the guided reading condition. The explicit instruction intervention was very much direct instruction in phonics and phonemic awareness. Some of the components, particularly the phonics part, had scripted lessons. Um, but it also included a period of text reading practice for fluency and explicit instruction in listening comprehension and reading comprehension. So very direct. The teacher would model strategies or skills for comprehension and have the kids practice that in pairs and then individually. So that's what explicit instruction looks like. It's what I do it, we do it, you do it. That's sort of the definition of what we mean by explicit instruction. The, this is what we used. Um, we used a program called Sound Partners by uh, Pat Vattacy and Sound Partners Plus which goes into multi-syllable word reading. Those are scripted uh, programs, and she has had great success with these programs in one-on-one -on -one instruction, even with paraprofessionals, people who aren't certified teachers. So if you're interested, she's got several publications uh, that describe what she did there. Um, we did text reading that was mostly decodable text, but some non-decodable put in also uh, with teacher support. Uh, we used the program called Quick Reads for Fluency Practice. And I developed, along with someone who helped me, a, uh, an explicit systematic program in comprehension. So that was also part of the daily lesson. Both groups, this time four days a week, 45 minute lessons, October through April, groups of two to three, it was a pullout. We trained the teachers, we hired them, and they were part of the research team. So what I am showing you here are effect sizes. And for those who might not be real familiar with this idea, effect sizes are a way of showing the difference in, uh, in the effects or the gains children make in different conditions. So it's, it, it shows the comparison between different conditions. So the red bar is a contrast between guided reading and typical instruction. The blue bar shows the contrast between the uh, explicit instruction intervention and typical practice. And the green is the contrast between those two interventions, the explicit and guided reading. Make sense? So let me walk you through untimed word reading. Now, first of all, I'm going to back up and tell you the hypothesis that I had made at the beginning of this study was that children would do much better in word reading and non-word <coughs> reading with the very explicit condition based on kind of what we
we knew, I thought that would do better. And I thought it was possible that the guided reading condition might do better in comprehension because they spent a lot more time reading. And I thought they would do better in fluency too, just because more time was spent with text. <coughs> so, look at untimed word reading. The, I'm going to get over here and point. I don't want to step on anybody. Um, this is the contrast again between the guided reading and typical practice. This means the difference was statistically significant for guided reading in untimed word reading. This is the contrast for the explicit instruction versus typical practice. So this is the size of the effect. Okay, a little over 0 0.30. They're almost identical. This is the contrast between the two. You see very little difference that you would expect in effects if you implemented one or the other. They were equally effective in teaching untimed word reading. And that kind of surprised me because the guided reading approach did not have explicit instruction. They didn't teach kids to sound out words every time they get to a difficult word. They did tell them, look at the picture and think about what makes sense. And some of those things that I thought might not support accurate word reading. And yet, the effects are virtually identical. Comparison to the comparison group was significant for both conditions. So, um, phonemic decoding is nonsense word reading. This is the one that shows you can use phonics even if you don't know anything about the word because they're reading nonsense words, which again, that's like syllables. Syllables are usually little nonsense words, right? In this one, the explicit, oh, 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 oh. I didn't know that would happen. All right, there we are. The explicit approach did much better as far as the size of the effect in comparison to typical practice. That reminds me a little of the first study where the only difference between the two approaches was in word attack, which is what this is. Um, it was statistically significant. The difference between the two interventions was uh, about 0.28 effect size, which is small according to some uh, ways of categorizing, although I don't believe those numbers very much anymore, used to. Um, but that was not statistically significant. There were no statistically significant differences between the two intervention conditions. They weren't significantly different for any of them. However, you can expect to get stronger effects sometimes with one over the other. And I think that's pretty important too. All right, this is fluency. This one is word reading and decoding fluency. If you know about tests, this is the test of word reading efficiency and it's the composite score for that test. Um, in this one, you see the effect sizes about the same uh, for the guided reading, a little lower for the explicit. That sort of surprised me. Um, but and the reason this is negative, it's the low zero effect size, is that the effect size favored the uh, guided reading condition. So when you're reading papers, whatever's listed first. If that does better, they'll be positive. If the one that's listed second does better, they'll be negative numbers. That's just the way you do that. So you understand what's what. Um, yeah, it was a very small difference. It was only about 0 0.05 or so, 0 0.06, very, very small. So they virtually did the same. In passage reading fluency, Again, the effect size for the explicit condition was, was much higher than reading the te connected text. And you see the green line is larger, meaning there was more difference in the effect size uh, between the two interventions. This is a test of silent reading fluency and comprehension. And it really, that is a different construct for you grad students than uh, fluency 
safety or comprehension. We've done some tests, and this the Taj rack is the name of the test, uh, and it actually kind of comes out as a separate construct that looks at both fluency and comprehension together. And you see really nice effect sizes over 0.6 for the explicit condition in that domain and 0.4 for guided reading. So not shabby there either. In comprehension, we gave two measures. In the Woodcock-Johnson passage comprehension test, we did have a significant difference between the explicit condition and typical practice. Not, we had much lower effects for the guided reading. See, this was the opposite of what I predicted. And there was a pretty big difference between the two groups. We also gave the gates McGinnity comprehension. The gates McGinnity, the kids have to read longer uh, passages. For in first grade, they actually read sentences and they look at pictures and they choose the sentences that best name what's happening in the picture. That's kind of how it looks in first grade. Uh, actually, this was second, so they would have been doing some of that picture stuff, but it would have been with paragraphs. So they're reading longer pieces of text. Um, not statistically significant in this case, but the effects were better for the explicit condition. So I think what I take away, oh my gosh, it's already one. Um, what I take away from this is that I think the things that are sort of non-negotiable are early intervention, having sufficient intensity, meaning do it long enough so the low kids really have a chance, and do it every day or four days a week regularly, don't cancel it, um, explicitly teaching what you want the kids to know, <coughs> using data-based instructional planning, looking at mastery tests or, or progress monitoring, systematic sequential ap approach with object easier objectives taught before the more difficult ones and confusion separated, and a lot of practice with feedback and a lot of scaffolding because whatever that practice becomes a habit. If you're ever afraid to correct a child who's doing something wrong, you're not doing them any favors if you don't correct them because they're going to keep doing it wrong. And every time they do it wrong, it builds in more practice. And that becomes more and more an ingrained automatic response. So part of the task of intervention is to change those habits. That's why it's so hard to intervene with older kids because the habits are so practiced that it is very hard to change them. If habits were easy to change, we would all weigh, what, 110 pounds, we would exercise every day, we would do everything we're supposed to do, right? But habits are hard to change. Guided application and meaningful text, I think, is important. Um, but it can be decodable. It might not be decodable. I think this is really important, and this doesn't come directly from those studies, but from my experience. Teachers really have to feel competent in implementing the program, and they have to recognize that it has positive effects for their kids. That is sort of the bottom line as far as getting the program actually implemented. So if it's too complicated, I am guilty myself. I've put together these complicated interventions that just look beautiful but they don't get done, and they don't get done with fidelity because it's just too much. Simple is better. I have loved this quote. Now, I have to tell you that Richard Allington is not one of my favorite people, <laughs> and because of things that he wrote around 2000-ish, in which he actually directly attacked people who I was working with and who care and respect, care about, I care about and respect very much. He, I don't like him much, but back in 1994, he made a statement that I think really summarizes a lot. Children are more likely to learn what they're taught than what they're not. So expecting kids, especially children who are easily confused, those are our babies <coughs> if we're working with the low kids, 
that's my, my domain, they're easily confused. They do better if you show them what to do, if you explain it well, and you give them a lot of feedback. If you just kind of let them try to figure it out on their own, it usually turns out a mess. They do better if you break down instruction into accessible steps and you teach necessary pre-skills before they actually implement uh, the bigger skill. What's more negotiable? I have come to believe the decodable text piece is more negotiable. There is some research showing whether it's one-on-one -on -one intervention or very small group, even for tier three, either will work. Scripted versus non-scripted, I think that's pretty negotiable. And the proportion of decontextualized practice, I think that's negotiable too. What do we need to know more about? A lot. And I'm cognizant of the fact that some people need to leave. Um, but I think, you know, all of these still need to be figured out, especially intervening with older kids, effective comprehension instruction, and I'm kind of going into these areas now. Um, people have moved on to math and reading uh, funding has kind of gone down and the interest has gone down and they kind of say, oh, well, you guys have that all figured out. Well, not true. For one thing, there are always, no matter how many significant differences we get, there are always kids who don't respond well. I did an intervention once where we gave kids two hours a day at tier three. I am not kidding. Two hours of intervention every day. And I had three or four kids who actually went down. So we haven't solved the puzzle, especially with tier three, especially with the ones who will now be in special education because they didn't respond to all the other good things that are going on. So what are special ed teachers supposed to do, I ask you? You know, we've already tried all the good things we know how to do. Well, here's the kid. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so lots of things still need to be uh, worked on. This is just sort of um, my current projects, and Dr. Joshi actually talked about those before. This one is quite interesting. I can't tell you anything about the findings because it's actually considered a clinical trial by the National Institutes of Health, NICHD, and the PIs of the project cannot see any aggregated results until all data have been collected. And we are in our last year of data collection, so soon I'll be able to look, but I can't tell you anything about what's working. But what we did, actually that's the wrong one. What we did is we assigned kids who have both ADHD and reading problems to get just reading intervention, which was very intensive intervention, one-on-one -on -one or groups of two, or ADHD intervention alone, which was a combination of a medication intervention, which is the state of the art, best intervention, for kids who have serious ADHD, and I, I've changed what I think about that during this study, um, and uh, also the ADHD intervention included parent training, so parents came to parent training, um, or some kids got both. So the question we're trying to ask, answer is, you have a kid come into the school who has both of these problems, is it enough, as some teachers would say, to just get them on meds and everything will be fine. Is it enough to just give them intensive intervention and everything will be fine? Or do you really have to attack both conditions and treat both conditions? So that's what we'll be able to talk about in about a year. <laughs> this is my adolescent project. Uh, we did a think aloud study, which is verbal protocols where kids talk, they stop, as they're reading occasionally to talk about what they are thinking. And that's tape recorded and transcribed and we coded them. And we coded 647 think aloud protocols, which is the largest ever done. You will not find another study with this size. Um, and those were adolescents in grades seven through 12. 
We also developed a new comprehension strategy survey. Um, and I've done a couple of very small sort of design experiments uh, of interventions based on what we found here. So that is it. This is my uh, homage to uh, the NICHD, which I'm required to. These folks gave us the money. It's your tax money at work, by the way, from the feds. This is my contact information, and there's a website where you can get the slides. It's down kind of below. It is actually Texas LD Center. Dot org. So Texas LD Center, all one word. Dot org. This is the website of the Texas Center for Learning Disabilities, which funded half of the research I'm talking about. So it will be posted on that website if you'd like to get the slides. Thank you. Thank you very much.